I know who to bring to my eulogy. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before I get started, I wanted to know how many people here are undergraduates? Okay. How many people are graduate students? How many people are faculty? How many people are administrative people? How many people are just lost? Don't, neither <laughs> okay. How many people are from the state of Maryland, grew up in the state of Maryland? How many are from outside Maryland? How many people are from outside the United States originally? Okay. Anybody from Baltimore? Anybody go to Baltimore City College? No, nobody. Okay. Um, how many people here are glad they're at the University of Maryland? Okay. How many people here want to go into business? How many people want to be an entrepreneur? Anybody for private equity? Investment banking? How many people want to make a billion dollars? <laughs> okay, how many people want to give away a billion dollars? Okay. How many people wish they'd listened to their mother and gone to medical school? Anybody? <laughs> okay, a couple. My mother wanted me to be a dentist. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my background. And the reason I do it is not so much to tell you what a wonderful person I am, but it's to tell you how you can overcome certain disadvantages, or maybe you make them into advantages, and how I came to start a firm that is now the largest private equity firm in the world with no qualifications for it and by making a lot of mistakes. And so all of you, I hope, will think that um, you know, if you're not first in your class, or you're not the star of your class, and I was not, you don't need to necessarily feel your future is doomed. I also have a view, and I'll talk a little bit later, about what I think it takes to be a good investment professional, what it takes to be a good entrepreneur, and what I would give you as some career advice, and then I'll you know, take time for questions, and I will give you a little bit about my views on the economy before we end. Um, let me give you my background. I, uh, if my, if most times, if you meet somebody whose last name is Rubenstein, you say, okay, his father's probably a doctor, a lawyer, maybe a dentist. Um, uh, but there are a lot of blue-collar Jews. And in Baltimore, <laughs> I grew up in Baltimore. Baltimore was the most rigidly segregated city in the United States by religion because the mortgages forbade you to sell a home to somebody who was Jewish or black. So when I was growing up in the 50s in the United States, in, in Baltimore, uh, you know, we had to, like, they lived in a Jewish ghetto because the Jews couldn't buy homes in other parts of Baltimore. So they all lived in northwest Baltimore. And basically, it was a very cloistered area. I was, you know, before I was 13, I, I thought everybody in the world was Jewish. I didn't know anybody wasn't Jewish. After 13, I realized not that many people were Jewish. But in this area of Baltimore, um, it was uh, filled with my part of it, blue-collar Jews. My parents, my mother was uh, 17 when she got married. My father was 20. He came back from World War II, met my mother. I was married. I was, they were married, and then I was born more than nine months after they got married. And um, uh, my father uh, had no, did not graduate from college, didn't graduate from high school. My mother didn't graduate from high school either. So my father worked his entire career in the Postal Service in Baltimore, never made more than $7,000 a year. Um, so I was their only child. And so I knew that although we didn't have a big family, that I couldn't afford to go to college. I couldn't afford to go to any college, probably, uh, 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 without scholarships. And so I decided I would try very hard to, to get scholarships. And when I was in the sixth grade, I remember watching John F. Kennedy give his favorite, famous speech, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And although I was only in the sixth grade, our teacher came back the next day and tried to get me to understand that speech much more. And I realized that uh, the making of money has, had no appeal to me. I didn't understand it. My mother had the view that people that had money were in a different species and that we weren't going to be able to be in that species. We were lower collar blue-collar people, we just had to stay in our, in our kind of class, and that she thought the highest calling of mankind was to be a dentist. Because she said, <laughs> you know, if you're a dentist, you don't have to work on weekends, and, uh, and uh, you get, get call you, they call you a doctor, and it's great. And, and, and I said, what about I get arthritis in my fingers? What am I going to do? So I didn't have any interest in that, but I wanted to go into public service. That speech by John Kennedy inspired me to do so, so I figured I'm going to be a lawyer, go into politics, and, and ultimately go into government. So I went to Duke University. I got a, a big scholarship there. I, I applied to lots of schools, and I was an equal opportunity person. Whoever gave me the biggest scholarship, that's where I was going. <laughs> and, um, and Duke was a bit of a change for me because Duke had a Jewish quote in those days. Only 5% of the student body, it wasn't public then, but later I learned, that only 5% of the student body could be Jewish. They had a Jewish quota. So when I got to Duke, I, you know, I bought them where everybody knew it was my area was Jewish. I get the bar, Duke, there was virtually nobody Jewish. Um, so I, I decided I'd study hard, and I you know, got a good Good, reasonably good grades, and I got into law school, and I applied to every law school I could, and I figured whoever gave me, gave me the biggest scholarship, I would take it. And I, I wanted to go to Harvard Law School, and, and I was going to go there, and then all of a sudden, the University of Chicago showed up with a full scholarship. 
And I said, wow, this is great. And in those days, it, was, it seemed like a lot of money then. It cost $2,000 a year in tuition. I guess yours is a little bit higher now, right? <laughs> um, so $2,000, and, and it guaranteed my tuition and room and board for everything for three years. But I didn't have that much money, so I, I, it took $50 to send in the deposit for, for the law school to preserve your place, and $50 for the, uh, for the student housing. So I figured, you know, why do I want to waste $50 sending two $50 in? I'll just send $50 into the housing people, and they will surely tell the law school people that I'm going to show up. Why would I need the housing if I wasn't going to show up? <laughs> so I, you know, show up the day of law school, and all of a sudden, um, I go to register, and they say, well, you didn't send your $50 in. You've given your scholarship away, and your place is gone. So the blood drained out of my face. Uh-oh. I don't have a place to go to law school. I lost my scholarship. And I said, wait a second, don't you understand? I sent $50 into the housing people. Why would I need that housing if I wasn't coming to law school? I said, that's a different department of the university. Nothing to do with, uh, with the law school. So I was really very nervous about it. And then they came back 20 minutes later, and I, I said, OK. Uh, they said, OK, I'll give, we'll give you the scholarship, and, and you can come. So I went there, and I, I, I was very fortunate. And, uh, and, and I repaid them recently by giving them $10 million so they give out scholarships. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so it was a good investment for them. But um, so I went, so I wanted to go into politics. And I, that person who wrote that famous inaugural address by John Kennedy, his name was Ted Sorensen. Some of you may have heard of him. He was 31 years old when he was the top advisor to President Kennedy. Jacqueline Kennedy, the first lady, was only 31 when she became first lady. It's hard to believe that she could be first lady at 31. But Ted Sorensen had left, the, had left uh, the White House when President Kennedy was assassinated. He stayed shortly thereafter with President Johnson. Then he went to practice law at Paul Weiss. And Paul Weiss was a famous law firm in New York because in those days, law firms in New York were either Jewish or not Jewish. And if you were not Jewish, law firms, you know, if you were Jewish, you weren't going to get a job there. This one was half Jewish, half not Jewish. So I went there because they had people like Ted Sorensen and Adlai Stevenson had been there and, and a lot of other prominent uh, political people. I thought they would give me contact. So after I spent a couple years there, I uh, was thinking about doing something else. And I said to the people at, uh, I was practicing law with, you know, I'm thinking of doing something else. I want to go into politics and government. I might leave this firm. Nobody said, don't leave. I said to my clients, I might be leaving, you know, I won't be here anymore. Nobody said, don't leave. So I took it that I wasn't that great a lawyer. I took a hint. And I finally persuaded Ted Sorensen to get me an interview with somebody who was running for president so I could maybe wind up in the White House. And he got me an interview with a man who was running for president of the United States in 1976. And this man's name was Birch Bayh. And his son, Evan Bayh, just retired from the Senate. Birch Bayh was thought to be a likely candidate to get the presidential next, uh, nomination in 76, and Democrats were clearly going to win because Nixon and Ford were pretty unpopular. So um, I thought if I get with Birch Bayh, he's going to be nominee. I'll get the job at the White House. I'll be like Ted Sorensen. I can do great public policy things. Unfortunately, 30 days after I joined his operation, he dropped out. So I figured, uh-oh, I wasn't that great at practicing law. Nobody thought I was a great lawyer. And 30 days after I joined Birch Bayh's operation, he dropped out. So my career is going nowhere. And all of a sudden, I got a call out of the blue, as some of you will in your career, from somebody I didn't know, and I still can't remember the person's name, who said, I heard about you. Would you like to have a job working in somebody else's campaign? So I rolled my eyes and said, who is it? And they said, Jimmy Carter. And he's, he's going to get the nomination, and you can work in his general election campaign. So I took the interview, I got the job, and I moved down to Atlanta to work in the campaign. At that time, Jimmy Carter was 33 points ahead of Gerald Ford. At the end of, after my work was done, he won by one point. So <laughs> Carter often said to me, like, what was your contribution? You know, I was doing much better before you showed up. But White House staffs are not filled on merit. They're filled on people working campaigns. So at the age of 27, three years out of law school, I became the deputy domestic policy advisor to the President of the United States, a job for which I was completely unqualified. But I thought Carter was unqualified, too. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, he'd only been governor of Georgia for four years. He didn't know anything either. So here I am. I have an office in the West Wing. Uh, the President of the United States is calling me, asking me my advice. And the reason he was calling me all the time was this. Right in the transition, he said, I want to honor all my promises. And it was the usual thing for a politician to say, maybe. And the, the internet, internet didn't exist then. So you had to go back and, and, uh, and, and to, if you wanted to know what people said and, and what his promises were, he had to go back and do all this research. So he asked me to go back to read every speech he'd given in two years, and all the questionnaires, all the interviews, and compile all his promises so he knew exactly what he promised, and then to sit in all the meetings with him so I could tell him whether somebody's proposing something that would violate a promise. So I'm sitting in meetings with the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, they're recommending things, and, and, and the President of the United States would say, well, David, what do you think of that? And I'd say, well, it violates your promise, Mr. President. And he'd say, I'm not going to do it. So, you know, I had a lot of influence. And, you know, there's no doubt. <laughs> 
there's no doubt, you know, if your parents are work, you know, have no money and they're not very famous people and you're 27 years old and you are, you know, walking out of the Oval Office with the President of the United States and you, just the two of you, getting on Marine One to go to Camp David, it's a pretty heady thing. Your parents are sitting there, your friends are sitting there saying, hey, how did this guy get this job? So it was a great time. Unfortunately, one of my jobs was to fight inflation, and I got it to 19 percent. Very difficult to do that. <laughs> and, you know, but people thought that I might get promoted, and Carter's view is that the rumor that I would be the senior domestic advisor in the second term was what kept him from getting reelected. I don't know if that's true, but I lo we lost the election, and then I found out what people said in Washington is true. If you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. Because all of a sudden, all the people told me how brilliant I was, I, they wouldn't call me back. I couldn't get a job. Couldn't get a job. Took me four, five, six months before I could convince a law firm to hire me. Here I was, and one day I'm at Paul Weiss, and next day I'm at the White House, and then we lose an election. Nobody wanted an ex Carter White House aide, so I had to go back and practice law again. Started at the bottom. And once again, none of my clients thought I was that great, and none of my colleagues thought I was that great, but I really didn't like what I was doing. And my view in life is, if you don't love what you're doing every day, you've got to do something different. You're never going to be great at what you're supposed to do um, if you don't love what you're doing. If you don't want to come into work every day um, and, and do what you're supposed to do, then you should do something else because life is too short. And I didn't love what, I, what lawyers do in Washington, D.C., so I was thinking about what to do, and I read about a man named Bill Simon who was Secretary of Treasury in, under, under President Ford. And after he left, what he did is he bought a company called Gibson Greeting Cards. And he bought it from RCA, and he put in a um, million dollars of his own money, and he, and he made $80 million in two and a half years. It was called a, a leverage buyout, which is a new phrase. And I said, I, geez, I like that. You put a million dollars in, and you get $80 million in two and a half years. <laughs> so I went down the street to Bill Miller, who was Secretary of the Treasury in the uh, Carter administration, who also been chairman of the Federal Reserve, and I said, look, you were Secretary of Treasury, Bill Simon was Secretary of Treasury, why don't you set up a firm in Washington that'll be the first firm in Washington that does leverage buyouts? And he said, yes, let's do that, and I would help out from the law firm. But he set it up, and he didn't really want to be a, a principal, he wanted to be more of an advisor, so I was frustrated that for two or three years nothing was getting done. So finally I said, I'm going to get a, a leverage buyout firm started. And then as I was reading it, uh, reading about it, thinking about it, I read a thing in a newspaper that said, that entrepreneurs have a, a time clock, not unlike a woman's biological time clock. And between the ages of 28 and 37 is when you're most likely to start a company. And after the age of 37, your chance of starting a company reduces just like a woman's chance of reproducing, let's say, after a certain age goes down. So I, I was 37 years old when I read this. And I said, uh-oh, uh, <laughs> my chance of ever starting a company is going down. It's going to be diminished if I don't do it. So I said, all right, I'm not going to find other people. My, my goal had been to find people who knew something about leverage buyouts and finance, get them together, and I would be maybe the lawyer for them. But I said, no, I tell you what, I can't wait. Nobody I can, wants to do this. I'll do it myself. So I recruited um, two guys from Marriott and one guy from MCI, a person on a cold call I met him, and we recruited him. He had been the CFO. And then the four of us came together, and I convinced them all I had some money to, to do this with. But as they got there, they realized I didn't have any money. So we had to go out. In the first six months, we raised five, um, $5 million. That's all we could raise. Two million to operate the company for two years, and three million to invest. That's all we had. And then gradually, we started doing deals, and one got better than the other, and the returns were good, and the word spread. And, and the firm grew, and today, as you heard, it's the largest private equity firm. We actually manage now, at the end of April, it'll be $150 billion, and uh, we now have invested about $70 billion of equity over the years, and it's at a gross internal rate of return of about 30%. So if you can invest $70 billion to get a 30% gross rate of return, you're probably going to attract a lot of money. And so we now have the largest investor base in the private equity world uh, and uh, the largest number of people, and, and it's, it's worked out pretty well uh, for us. And the reason it did were, there were a couple things we did. We did, you know, anybody that starts a company, by definition, you have to do something that somebody else didn't do if you're going to really be successful. If you just try to replicate what somebody else did, you're probably not going to be that great. Entrepreneurs are people who want to do something that somebody else didn't do. And so our, what we tried to do was were several things that nobody else had done. The first was, of course, located in Washington. Washington was not a place that people thought you could do leverage buyouts. You did that out of New York. So we try to say we're going to make an advantage of it, and we're, what we're going to do is, is follow the advice of Everett Dirksen. Everett Dirksen had been a Senate minority leader in the 1960s who helped the Civil Rights uh, Act get passed as a minority leader. And he said, when you're getting kicked out of town, get out in front and pretend you're leading a parade. Now, what does that mean? That means take advantage of the situation you find yourself in. If you're getting kicked out of town, tell everybody you're leading a parade. Well, we said, we're in Washington, D.C., but we don't want to be in New York because we want to invest in companies that are heavily affected by government. And what better way to do that by being in Washington? So investors say, well, that makes sense. You probably understand 
companies affected by government like Booz Allen more, more better than people in New York. So we started raising money on that basis and we started doing deals, companies based in Washington, the aerospace area, defense area, or telecommunications. And then we came up with three ideas um, that really changed the face of the private equity world. One of which we got criticized for and we ended, but one of them, one, th that idea was to bring in people who are very famous from government. Because our theory was nobody ever heard of us, but if I could bring in people who had been high officials in government, I could get my calls returned, I could get meetings with people. So we brought in Frank Carlucci, he'd been Secretary of Defense, he could get people to call him back and, and, and so forth. And four years later when, Bill, when uh, uh, Jim Baker was leaving as Secretary of State, I figured, well, what could be better than bringing Jim Baker, great Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury in? And I figured also if you want to raise money in the Middle East, taking Baker there, better name than Rubenstein probably to raise the money in the Middle East. So, <laughs> um, so he came in and then we got former President Bush 41 to come in and help us in China and Asia where he was well known and then John Major. So we had all these former people who were very, very prominent and it helped us get, get going. After a while we were criticized for it and in the end I, I changed it and I brought in Lou Gerstner as our chairman because we were being criticized for having undue influence which wasn't the case. But, but it helped us get started. People knew who we were and even today people still think that Jim Baker or Pre President Bush are still with us. But the two things that we did that really changed the entire face of private equity were these, th these things. Private equity was a mom and pop business historically. You had a small fund, three or four people, they have a fund, and after they were done investing that fund, they'd raise another fund. When KKR did the famous RJR deal in 1989, they only had seven investment professionals, that's all. It was very small. And um, we ra went out and raised a buyout fund, and what we, after we raised our second buyout fund, somebody came to me and said, are you going to put that in venture capital? And I said, no, it's a buyout fund. They said, too bad, I'm looking for a venture fund. Well, a light bulb went off my head and said, wait a second, maybe I can have a venture fund. Now, why is that such an unusual idea? Well, all the partnership agreements said in all these buyout funds and venture capital funds, you can only have one fund at a time. You have to spend 100% of your time on that one fund. Well, and people didn't think I was a great investor. I'd made myself into the fundraiser, and the guys managing the funds were somebody else. So I thought nobody would care if I went out and sort of recruited a venture team and raised the venture fund around them. And I did. And we had a, sec we had a second fund. That had never been done in private equity before. Nobody had ever had two different funds in the same time. I said, well, this works. Why don't we do our real estate? And then we came up with the idea of having multiple funds, centralizing the uh, fundraising, accounting, legal, and tax in Washington, and having people that we give a large stake in the fund to, and they'd also get some stake in the parent, but we recruit all these people. And so we ultimately created about 90 different funds, which we now manage all over the world. And now everybody else has more or less followed that pattern. The second thing we did that changed the face of private equity was to globalize the business. Historically, private equity was a business where you, you, if you're American, you invest in America. If you're Asian in Asia, European in Europe. We said, why don't we take our brand name, Carlisle, and go to Europe and put it, hire some Europeans and put our brand name on it and say we can do buyout deals in Europe just the way we did in the United States. Now there's, that's a big leap of faith. Just because you can do deals in the United States doesn't mean you can do them in Europe. It's a different culture, different way of doing things. But we convinced people. So we raised the Europe fund, an Asian fund, a Japan fund. So we globalized and then we basically built the firm that way by institutionalizing it and globalizing it. And as you know, the other large private equity firms are doing this as well. Today, um, we, we've, we now are in a situation where uh, the firm is pretty well known around the world. We invest all over the world, and our biggest source of uh, profits these days is actually in China. We are the largest private equity firm investing in the emerging markets. And the emerging markets are clearly where the great uh, upside is for people like us, in part because the world has shifted a bit. Uh, when President Kennedy was elected president, uh, the United States had 46% of the world's GDP. We have 22% today. So if we're one-fifth of the GDP of the world and you're going to be a global investor, you can't put all your money in the United States, or you shouldn't. Also, in, the, in, in President Kennedy's day, the United States economy was growing at 6% or so, 7% a year. Uh, today, it's growing at 2 or 3%. Uh, the emerging markets where the great growth is and where you can buy things at lower prices and so forth. So it's a much more attractive area, and we're spending a lot of our time in the emerging markets. And now we actually have more people out of the United States than in the United States, and we have more people. We're investing more money out of the United States than we are in the United States. And that trend, Robbie, will continue for a long time. In my own case, um, as we got to be moving forward and the firm became successful, um, I began to realize that uh, I'd made a fair amount of money. And I, when I turned 54, I read that somebody who was a white Jewish male, at, you know, on average, would live to be 81 years old. So doing arithmetic quickly, I realized I had lived two-thirds of my life. Um, I said this on television once, and Warren Buffett sent me a letter saying, no, your arithmetic was terrible because it's 81 if you're born, when you're born. But actually, if you've already lived to 54, you'll probably live to 85. He says, I'm an actuarial guy because I own an uh, insurance company. But OK, so whether I lived to be 81 or 84 or 85, um, I realized I'd lived uh, uh, two-thirds of my life, more or less. And I'd made a reasonable amount of money by in normal human standards. And I decided that I didn't want to take it with me. You know, the ancient Egyptian pharaohs thought you could be buried with your wealth. 
and there's no evidence that you really need it when you're dead. So, <laughs> so I decided I wanted to start giving it away. I didn't want to be um, like these people you read about who have all this money and they die and then some executor gives it away in ways they didn't know or care about or would have cared about. So I decided to start getting involved in philanthropy and, and starting helping organizations that helped me and helping causes that I thought were important. And now I spend a fair amount of time on it. And I'll tell you, sometimes I, I you know, the things that are obvious, like giving scholarships to universities I went to or, or, or scholarships in areas that I live in or helping in medical research and things like that. But sometimes you don't really know what's going to happen. And sometimes I try to do philanthropic things in areas I didn't anticipate. And I'll just mention one of those areas. One is, um, is an area of trying to get people to know more about uh, our country and our history. And uh, I, toward that end, when I was one day reading about a, a, uh, an auction that was going to occur in, in New York, it was an auction of the Magna Carta, the most famous document in, in, let's say, Western civilization. And I wanted to go see this famous document, so I went to Sotheby's, where it was going to be auctioned off the next day, and they explained to me that there are 17 copies of the Magna Carta, the most famous document in, in Western civilization. Fifteen of those are in British institutions, they'll never be sold. One is in the Australian Parliament, and one was bought by Ross Perot in 1982. And he bought it from a British family that had it in his possession for 500 years. He um, paid about a million and a half dollars for it, brought it back to the United States. And it was important because this is the document that really inspired the founding fathers when they were writing the Declaration of Independence, the uh, Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and really part of our whole legal fabric. And I thought it'd be important to keep in this country. The curator said it was going to probably be sold to somebody in, in the Middle East, the Far East, but out of this country. So I just resolved in my mind that I was going to go back the next night and as a gift to the country, buy it and give it to the country. Now, I didn't want to tell my wife that I was going to buy the Magna Carta the next day. You know, <laughs> it sound a little presumptuous. I'm going to go buy the Magna Carta tomorrow. I'll talk to you about it. Um, <laughs> And I don't want to tell my children because I know they would say, how much less money does this mean for us? <laughs> uh, but I went back the next day and I rushed in there and I get to the Sotheby's and since I don't really collect art, I didn't know the place. I said, I, I got there five minutes before the auction and I said, okay, I want to go down there and bid like I see on TV. You put your hand up. And they said, no, no, go in this little side room and we'll call you. So they put me in the side room. I think they locked the door. And, and they put you on a phone and they start bidding. And the next thing I know, I, I won. I, I bought the Magna Carta. So the head of Sotheby's comes in and says, like, uh, who are you? We, you know, we don't know you. And you do have the money, right? Yes, yes, I have the money. <laughs> so, okay, you can slip out the side door and nobody will ever know uh, who you are, and as long as you pay. And, um, or you can talk to these reporters and they want to know who bought it. So I said, no, I'd like to say that this country's been really good to me. I, I came from very modest circumstances. And what I want to do is make a down payment on my gift and my debt to the country. So I'm going to give this to the country. And so I gave it to the National Archives. And since then, it's led to my buying other things that I, I think are in the same thing. I bought a copy, uh, a rare copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. I gave it to the White House, where it's on display in the Oval Office. And I recently bought uh, a copy of the Declaration of Independence, and I put that in the State Department, where um, people can see it now in the Benjamin Franklin Room. So my idea is to let people see these documents and talk about American history. So that's one of the kind of philanthropic things I try to do. But anyway, I think philanthropy is a really important thing that increasingly um, is, is a subject that businessmen should focus on. Because as we all make money, we, we can't spend all this money, really. And we can't you know, ruin our children's lives by giving them all this money. So I think it's important to give it away. And I am trying to do that. It's not as easy as making it. But I, I, I do feel that if you, you know, any, anybody honestly can make money. If you work hard, you can make money. It's figuring out what to do intelligently with your money is not as easy as it might seem to you. But I do think that the advantage of philanthropy, A, you'll make somebody feel good, and you'll make, actually help something. You'll make yourself feel good. And then, you know, it's an option value. Um, you know, there may actually be a heaven, and in case you've taken out an option, if there is a heaven, you're giving away this money, you know, you never know, you'll be better off. But anyway, I, I do think that something that I'm spending a lot of my time on is philanthropy. I would like to mention uh, what it takes to be an entrepreneur and what it takes to, uh, to be in private equity or investing for a moment. To be an, on an entrepreneur, and, and uh, it was President Bush who famously said the problem with France is they don't, they don't have a word for entrepreneur. But um, <laughs> entrepreneurs are people who are driven to try to change the world. Let me talk about business entrepreneurs as opposed to social entrepreneurs for a moment. Business entrepreneurs are people who want to do something and change something. Generally, they're not as focused on making the money as proving that their idea works. And so the appeal of being an entrepreneur is you can be your own boss and you can say to yourself if it succeeds, I created something, I built something, I made something happen, I made the world a better place if your idea works. Now it's not that always that easy to do. Everybody doesn't have an idea that's going to work and everybody can't be Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or these people. But you know, a lot of times if you want to, uh, to really change the world and make yourself uh, your own boss, 
being an entrepreneur is a very attractive way to do it. It's not for everybody, but the people who do well in that are people who, A, don't listen to their parents, because your parents will never tell you to be an entrepreneur. Their parents will say, go be a dentist, a doctor, a lawyer, or go work at IBM, or something like that, or, or Carlisle. If you're one of, if, you know, um, you know, you, so you have to ignore your parents. They're not going to want you to be an entrepreneur and kind of struggle for a while. You have to be driven to try to prove that your idea works. You have to be willing to recognize that your idea probably isn't going to be the ultimate thing of what you do. Most people who start companies actually change what they do during the road. Um, Carlisle's original business plan bears no relation to what we're doing now. Bill Gates' original idea bears no relation to what he's doing now. And the same would true with Mark Zuckerberg and others. So you have to be willing to adapt. You have to be willing to work um, through lots of tough uh, problems and, and, and work very long hours and ignore creature comforts because you're not going to have a lot of creature comforts when you're starting. You also have to be able to communicate. Um, you know, if you don't know how to communicate people, convince people to do what you want, you're not going to convince people to buy your product or your service. So in making sure you know how to talk and communicate with people or write is very, very important. You also have to want to not make a billion dollars. You have to want to you have to want to you know, create a company. If you're focused only on the money, you probably won't be a great entrepreneur. Most entrepreneurs really wanted to prove that their concept worked as opposed to just making money. Now, at Carlisle, we don't hire a lot of entrepreneurs, to be honest. Entrepreneurs are people who are a little quirky and sometimes they don't fit in. Sometimes they're different. different. They may turn out to be Mark Zuckerberg, but you know, when a firm gets bigger and bigger, you tend to hire people with different kinds of standards. The best people in the world, the best entrepreneurs, are not going to work at Carlisle. If you're a great entrepreneur, you wouldn't come to Carlisle. You'd start your own company. So generally, we don't hire entrepreneurs. We hire people with these standards. I like to hire people who are reasonably intelligent. I don't want geniuses. Geniuses are too complicated to manage. And you know, every time I've hired a genius, I've regretted it. I don't want geniuses. I want smart people, but not geniuses. I want people that are willing to work hard. You can never accomplish anything great nine to five, five days a week. Nobody who you've ever admired uh, for whatever they have accomplished did it nine to five, five days a week. It just doesn't happen. So I want people that are willing to work hard and you know, not obsessively so to the point where they're just fatigued and they can't get anything done, but I want hard workers. I want people that actually know how to work with each other. You know, people who are just, don't always say, I want this, I want to do this, this is my idea. People that learn how to talk the word we and work as teams, because that's what's going to work in a company like ours. I'm looking for people that want to make a lot of money, not necessarily spend a lot of money. I want people that want the measurement of their success, perhaps the amount of money they may make, but they're not interested in buying yachts and all kinds of other things and living a lifestyle that seems inappropriate. I'm interested in people who know, who want to be part of a bigger company and want to make it grow better and feel like when they make a company grow, it's something that's important to them and who will recognize that the firm is more important than they are because you need that mindset as well if you're going to work in a company like ours or some other thing. And I want people that actually like the idea of being a principal. The advantage of being a, a private equity is you make something happen, you own something, you're the boss as opposed to being an advisor. And people that have that mindset, I think, are going to do well in a firm like ours. So those are the kind of people that we're often looking to hire. Now, let me uh, conclude by talking about what I think the country's problems are in the economy, and then I'll be happy to take your questions. And this is something that's very serious. Um, when I grew up, although we had a modest circumstances in my family, uh, the United States was the dominant economy in the world. And it has been the dominant economy for quite some time. We've been the biggest economy in the world since 1870. We'll lose that title probably in 2030 or so, um, depending how you measure to China. Now, being the second biggest economy in the world isn't so terrible, but we, we're going to have to recognize that our lifestyle of your lifestyle and your children's lifestyle is not likely to be the same as your parents, because the United States, in relative terms, is not going to be as wealthy. And we, we have to make some changes. And the reason we have to make some changes is that the so-called emerging markets are now have emerged. We've told the China and India and Brazil and other countries, you should have a capitalist system. You should have free trade. You should let your people be well-educated. You should let information come in. You should adapt to the best technologies. Well, they've done it, and now they're beating us at our own game. So we have to adapt. Now, one of the problems is we're, we're playing with one hand behind our back. And the reason is we've gotten fat and happy, and the result is we have uh, a government that's somewhat dysfunctional, and we have a financial system that can't go the way it's going much longer. Let me explain what I mean. We went into a recession. The recession was deep. It went all over the world. But the result of the recession being so deep in the United States was that we've come out of it uh, in a kind of half-hearted way. We have uh, too much debt still, too, much, too high a deficit. We have too high unemployment rate. Our dollar is really devalued in many ways. And our moral authority to tell the rest of the world what to do in the economy is gone. Let me talk about the debt, for example. When President Kennedy was elected President of the United States, we had a total debt of the United, in, in the United States of about $240 billion. The total debt 
the United States government was $240 billion. Today it is $14.2 trillion. $14.2 trillion. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac debt on top of that is $5 trillion more. The unfunded Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid liabilities are $117 trillion. So we have debt or unfunded liabilities of the federal government for, of $1 million for every taxpayer in the United States or $350,000 for every man, woman, and child. Completely and totally unsustainable. And to make sure you understand what a trillion is, if a million dollars was put in a bank account the day that Jesus Christ was born and another million dollars was put in that bank account every single day for the next 2011 years, you wouldn't have a trillion. You'd have about $700 billion. Well, we've got, you know, $14.5 trillion of debt plus the Fannie Mae debt plus the uh, unfunded liabilities. And we have about $5 trillion of unfunded liabilities in the states where the pension funds are underfunded. So if we don't tackle that problem soon, uh, we are just going to be paying interest and we're just going to basically be in a country that, that cannot sustain itself. The annual deficit in the United States today is $1.3 trillion. Our budget in the United States is $3.75 trillion. We had a fight in Washington the last couple of days. Should we cut that or not? We cut it by about 3%. 3%. So right now, we take in tax revenues every year of $2.6 trillion, and we spend $3.750 trillion. The amount of money we take in equals exactly the amount of money we need for entitlements plus defense spending. Everything else we're borrowing for. We can't sustain that. Third is unemployment. All of you are gonna, who are on the, gonna be in the job market will know this better than me. The unemployment, market, the unemployment rate in the United States is a little deceiving. Historically, in, in college textbooks, it would say that the full unemployment is four or 5%. In Europe, that was much higher. We are heading towards a permanent higher unemployment rate, as Europe is, unless we do something about it. And here's what I mean. Right now, the unemployment rate in the United States is officially 8.8%. That is a completely fallacious number. The reason is it counts only people who are looking for jobs in the last four weeks. We don't count people if you stopped looking for jobs or you stopped looking you know, a month or two ago, two months ago. The real unemployment rate, the so-called marginally attached rate, is 15.5%. The black unemployment rate in the United States is really about 20%. The Hispanic unemployment rate is about 16%. The black teenage unemployment rate in the United States is over 50%. Over 50%. So unless we attack this problem, we, we're never going to uh, really, and, and get jobs soon, we're, we're going to have a very high unemployment rate. And it's going to make our country much less productive. And in the, in the recent recession, three quarters of the people who lost their jobs were male. Now we have more women in the workforce for the first time in our country's history. Um, and it's probably going to produce a lot of, I'd say, social dislocation as a result of that. The dollar. We are the only reserve currency in the world. And the reason that our dollar has, has stayed as well as, it, uh, as, as high as it has relative to other currencies is because we're the only reserve currency. But the dollar is really steadily going down in value. A dollar from 1960 buys 14 cents today. A dollar from 1980 buys 55 cents today. And the dollar is going down. It's going down about, in real value about 10 percent over the last year and a half or so. Um, if the euro had gotten its act together and the euro had worked better, the euro would be much higher than it is against the dollar today. And the RMB, is, is, would, if it was freely traded, would be much higher than it is today. It, right now, um, if, because we're the only reserve currency, people have to buy dollars. But if there are other reserve currencies that come along, the dollar will go down dramatically. So if we don't solve our dollar problem and make it clear that it's going to be the, the, really the only reserve currency in the world and deserves to be. If we don't solve our debt problem, we don't solve our deficit problem, we don't solve our unemployment problem, the United States cannot be competitive with other emerging markets or other emerging markets around the world. We were the greatest emerging market at one point. And in the 1700s, the 1800s, the United States was an emerging market and we became the greatest emerging market in the history of the world. Japan was the greatest emerging, emerging market in the 20th century. The last half 20th century, they became the second biggest economy in the world. Obviously, in, in this century, China is the great emerging market in India and Brazil. And we have to play catch up a bit. Now, we have some advantages in playing catch up. We have the greatest university system in the world, greatest R&D system in the world. We have the freest economy in the world. We have the, um, I'd say, the best rule of law in the world. We have the, the most transparent financial system in the world. But we have a lot of problems we have to tackle. And, and the people in Washington are not tackling them. Washington is very good at solving crises when it's right on top of them and, and the world's about to fall apart. Chronic problems they can't solve. Whether they can solve the debt limit problem and the other entitlement problems, I don't know. But right now, you have to be somewhat pessimistic about the United States' ability to solve these problems. So my hope is that all the great resources we have and all the great things about the country will ultimately come together and, and make Congress do what it needs to do to solve our debt problems, our deficit problems, and other things. So I hope all of you will recognize that you've got to do a lot of work to build a, a lifestyle and build a job and a career for yourself 
uh, more than you would have done 20 years ago because it's going to be harder to find good jobs in this country unless we make some changes. And we're going to have much more competition from overseas than we once had. Now, many of you are from overseas and may you, be, you may be going back to those countries. Those countries are going to be much more competitive in the United States than we've ever had before. And for the United States to be what it once was, and, and, and uh, I think we've got to make some real changes. I'm not completely optimistic we can do them in the short term. But anyway, let me end there and say that I think all of you, um, you know, have the potential to be entrepreneurs, no doubt, if you want to. All of you have the potential to be in private equity. I'm happy to talk about the virtues of private equity versus other things or how to get a job. And I don't have, uh, I don't know if anybody brought their resumes, but um, I'm happy to talk to you about any of the subjects I talked about. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about your time as deputy, deputy assistant. Sorry, I was wondering if you could talk about your time as deputy assistant for domestic right. policy, right. and um, what advice you would give to someone that was looking to to go into public yes. policy or public service. Pu correct. Okay. When when President Kennedy made his famous speech, I thought that public service meant going into government, because that was really what government and public service meant. I now think that the world has changed and NGOs. Uh, can do a very effective job of helping one contribute in public policy. And I think there are so many socially, uh, social entrepreneurial related companies you could, or organizations one could join, you could do a great deal as well. I don't think you have to go in the government in order to serve your country or to serve, uh, improve the public policy. But if you do want to go in the government, I do think it's, you have to do it at one of two times. Do it very early or do it relatively late. Yeah, I think going to government when you're in your 40s and you're mid of your career, it's very difficult because transitioning in and out is not as easy as people would like it to be. We do allow people to transition in and out of government in this country much more than other countries. Other countries, you're either in government or you're in business, you can't go back and forth. In this country, you can, but I think it's very good to do it early. And, and as you do it early, you, you know, you're, you're young and you can afford the lower incomes you're probably going to get. You have the energy to work these long hours. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's a matter of luck getting, getting these jobs. Again, they're not filled on merit. I think. Uh, to be honest, it doesn't make much difference what you do before you're 30, and my theory is that, that you, know, you should try many different things because you won't know what you're really going to do or want to do with your life until you're probably in your 30s, and you should try different things. You don't want to be 40 years old or 45 and looking back and saying, I wish I had tried different things when I was younger. I, I'm, glad, I'm, I'm upset that I spent all my career at 25 years at one place or another. Try different things and experiment and try to get a job in public policy or public service if you want. I think it's much more fulfilling in many ways than business um, in some respects because you think you're, you're helping the world a little bit or you're helping the country a little bit. But I, I, I would recommend doing it earlier rather than later. Yes, ma'am. Um, what is the greatest challenge you see facing your company or just private equity in general? And what um, is sort of your vision for growing company? Okay. The greatest challenge facing um, my company and in the industry or my company? Uh, both. All right. The greatest challenge facing the private equity industry now is, is this. Um, we've gone through a deep recession and now we're coming back out of it and deals are getting done again and distributions are occurring, but we have to make sure that the thing that made the private equity industry grow was the rates of return. Uh, the rates of return in private equity overall are better than the rates of return in public market indexes. So if you were in over the last five years, 10 years, 15 years in a public market index in the United States, S&P 500 for example, and, and you were in an, uh, an equivalent of a uh, private equity index, you would be better off by being in the private equity by 300 to 600 basis points. But if you were in a top quartile private equity firm, you would have been better anywhere by two to nine times over the public market index. So whether we can continue to get these rates of return that make it um, so appealing to people to give us money is a challenge. I think rates of return for private equity could come down. Probably public market returns will probably come down as well, but I think the challenge is sustaining the returns. Uh, secondly is um, uh, keeping the Congress away. Um, as Will Rogers once famously said, um, the country is never safe as long as Congress is in session, and I think that's my view. So Congress could do some things to upset the private equity industry and change the way things are taxed or a whole bunch of other things, so I'm always worried about Congress. Third. Um, we have to recognize that the challenge that the private equity industry has is a bit global in this sense. That all the global private equity firms are based in America. We're 22% of the world's economy, we're 100% of the global private equity firms. That can't continue very long. Right now, people in China are investing, Chinese, let's say insurance companies or people in China or Chinese government is investing with us in China to invest in China and I have Chinese natives doing the investing for us. At some point, people in China will say, wait a second, what do I need Carlo in the middle of the act? Why don't we create a Chinese 
global private equity firm based in China and just give the money to Chinese natives and invest and have all the profits go to China. So at some point, uh, other parts of the world are going to wake up and build global private equity firms like we have in the United States. Another challenge is, is just making sure that the industry's image is better than it has been. The industry's image hasn't been wonderful for birthday parties and other things that people have done that got bad press. And so we have to make sure people understand we actually create jobs, pay our taxes, don't take jobs offshore, uh, care about the environment. And to the extent we, we, we convince people that that, and, and to the extent it's true, we'll be better off. If we, if we ignore all those concerns, we're going to have some problems. And for my own company, the biggest challenge is at the moment that the founders are 61 years old, which when my father turned that age, you know, I, I thought it was ready for a nursing home. 61 seems like a teenager today. But at some point, the laws of, of um, inevitability are such that I have to have younger people ultimately run the firm. And so the transition will, will be difficult because all transitions are, are going to be difficult. And when you have an entrepreneurial company, all entrepreneurs do not think that anybody can succeed them because they'd say, look, if you were a great entrepreneur, you wouldn't be at this company. You would have started your own company. So the people that I have that are below us now are really good, but they're not entrepreneurs. And all of us who are the senior people that started their company maybe want people with more entrepreneurial instincts. But in the end, we will ultimately have the transition. And whether, whether the, the firm can sustain a transition, you never know. Um, sometimes firms can do it, and sometimes firms cannot. We're not leaving anytime soon, but that's an ultimate challenge we have. It's the transition of management and leadership. Um, yes, sir. Right. It's disappeared. Yes. When you can speculate on the policy, okay. whether you agree with the policy or not, and if you think it's coming back. I, I couldn't hear your question. No, I. I... <laughs> All right, let me, let me explain. For those who. What do you think about the Red Sox? <laughs> uh, I like the Orioles better, but um, <laughs> let, let me explain. For those who are not intricately, uh, in, I, I'd say, following this with, with the care that I have, here, here's what's happened. And it just shows you the power of an idea. In the mid. 1930s, when people were developing or drilling for oil in the United States, uh, the people that were raising the money to drill for oil, they were called promoters. And when they kind of raised the money to drill for oil, they would get a piece of the profits. It was called a promote or something like that, a carried interest. And they, it was taxed. The IRS said then, well, you, you kind of took a risk. It's not a salary. You might not get paid if it doesn't, the oil well doesn't come through. Yeah, we'll, we'll tax that as a capital gain. So when real estate partnerships were formed in the 60s and 70s, they had the same principle. And venture capital partnerships and private equity partnerships, the same principle. The people that put these deals together, even though they are, may not be investing their own money, they are taking a risk, is the theory, and therefore the profit, the profit share, the 20% should be taxed at capital gains rates, not ordinary rates. Now that wasn't such a big deal when the ordinary rate and the capital gains rate wasn't that big a difference. And when the ordinary rate went, let's say it's 35, and the capital gains rate is 15, it's a big difference. Well, a law professor at the University of Illinois wrote an article several years ago saying, by the way, do you realize that these terrible private equity people, they're being taxed at capital gains, at ordinary rates, not capital gains rates, and they're not adding any value to society. Why doesn't Congress do something about this? Well, he then got 535 copies of that article and sent one to every member of Congress. It's a good idea. And they all said, hey, this is interesting. I don't think more than three members of Congress knew about it. So all of a sudden, it was seen as a way to pick up revenue. And all of a sudden, people were saying you know, that Warren Buffett's uh, or the, my assistant or, or has a higher tax rate than, than or pays more taxes than I do or something like that. Higher tax rate, I should say. Uh, not more taxes, but higher tax rate. Um, so it got to be a good bumper sticker issue and so forth. Uh, it, I was surprised that it didn't pass the Congress because private equity people are not beloved. We were not beloved and we didn't have the sway in Capitol Hill. Um, and so what happened was it's, an effort was made to change it a couple times. It almost passed this time and the reason it didn't is this, and this is a lesson. When you have something within your grasp, don't get greedy and reach for too much. What happened is Congress had the ability and the votes probably to pass this that would change the rate from the uh, ordinary to cap the capital to ordinary. But the people on Capitol Hill on the House side thought they had so much leverage that what they did is they said, not only do we want to change the rate for people like us, but if people like Carlisle want to take their company public and sell shares, that the, that the shares when we sell them are to be taxed, uh, when the profits we get are to be taxed at ordinary rates, not capital gains. So in other words, if Bill Gates sells his company, his shares are taxed to him at capital gains rate. If you're in private equity, you'll be taxed at ordinary rates. So people began to say, well, why is that fair? That, that we're treated differently than other companies. And so by overreaching and not focusing just on the rate for the private equity, uh, the House, I think, reached for too much and the Senate wouldn't swallow it. So in the end, it got killed. Uh, today, it was thought that um, 
we're not going to change taxes for two years. We just went through this in the lame duck. We, we, we did some things on taxes, and people said we, we're done with taxes for two more years until after the presidential election. But because we have such a financial problem now, and Congress is beginning to focus on it, I suspect that there will be some changes in taxes before the next presidential election, and this is a, a target. It doesn't pick up that much revenue. It picks up about, if you change the capital gains or the, the carried interest rate, it picks up about $22 billion over 10 years. Not a gigantic sum, but politically it's difficult to keep... Um, uh, from doing it. So I suspect at some point it would change, but I don't think it will change quickly. That's more than you wanted to know. But <laughs> yes, sir. I just wanted to ask about uh, Carlisle's uh, competitive advantage vis-a-vis um, -vis other firms. Right. So when you're sort of the success that you achieved over the years, how much of it would you attribute to sort of the, the picking winner side, and how much would you attribute to being able to bring resources to your portfolio companies in terms of customers and connections? Okay. And and on exit as well. And, and then in that context, what advice would you give to a smaller fund that didn't necessarily have that influence? Okay. Well, um, the private equity industry was relatively easy to do in the early days when these deals were called bootstrap deals. Now, they were, originally they were called bootstrap deals in the 1970s. Then bootstrap was not seen as a good word, so they went to leverage buyout. Then the word leverage became odious. They went to manage and buyout. Buyout became odious. They went to private equity. Now we're looking for a new name still. Uh, <laughs> but. We, um, in the early days of private equity, you would buy companies that are three or four times cash flow, 5% equity, 95% debt. And the US GDP was growing at 6%. So you could go to the beach and the leverage would enable you to kind of make a fair amount of money just by incenting a manager. Today, if you're putting in 50% equity, 50% debt, US GDP is growing at 2 or 3%, and you have to pay eight or nine or 10 times cash flow, you gotta really roll up your sleeves and, and, and do something to make that company so much more efficient that you can get 25% rates return. So all the private equity firms have recognized that and all the larger ones now say, hey, we're different than the other guys because we have operational managers. We have Lou Gerstner, we have Jack Welsh, we know how to roll up our sleeves, we add value, we're, we're really much better at adding value post the acquisition. And I think all of them have really struggled to actually prove that any one model works. In other words, the large glo global private equity firms have more or less the same rate of return on their major deals, even though they all use different methods to get there. So it's not clear that any one method is better. In Carlisle's case, what we try to say that our competitive advantage is, is that we have a global network. We have people from all over the world who are um, able to have expertise in given industry. So we're buying an automobile company in China. I can take my automobile people from New York, move them over, and, and, and they can understand the industry. And by being so global, we have the ability to help all of our companies all over the world. So what we're selling is our global reach. We're also selling our, uh, our kind of not high risk-taking profile, which we, we have a kind of modulated way, a low beta way of doing investing. And so we don't take high risk, and that's kind of what we're, we're selling. Other firms are selling different things. But the surveys show that most of the investors don't think that the big private equity firms are all that different, honestly, from each other. So we're trying to each distinguish ourselves from each other, but I don't think we're successfully doing so at the moment. For the smaller firms, um, they have a more competitive problem because they're not as well known and it's hard to get people to listen. And, and the surveys show that people don't want to be in first funds anymore or new organizations. They want to be with the tried and true, you know, the old saying, you can't get fired for buying IBM. Well, now you can't get fired for investing with Blackstone or TPG is the theory. So getting new funds off the ground is very, very difficult. So I have to look at each specific case. But my view is generally find something that is distinctive about you and just push it, push it, push it. Make it, you know, people remember what you're, why you're different than somebody else. You've got to make people think about you, and, they only, and they're only going to remember one or two things, and you've got to, you know, push that one or two things until they, they just can't forget it. Um, yes, sir. With respect to your, your philanthropy and just philanthropy yes. in general, what, what frustrates you most about the habits, of, the philanthropic habits of really wealthy people? Well, I won't mention names, but um, there are a lot of people who, well, the, the Bill Gates pledge, the, look, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates pledge, uh, what it says is you're going to give away half your money by the time you die or at your death. To me, what good is that? I mean, uh, you should give it away while you're alive so you can enjoy it and actually see the benefit of it, but why wait till you're dead to have, give away half your money? They, 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 they wanted to, to front load it earlier, but a lot of the people just wouldn't have signed up for it because they'd already got their estates planned, a lot of people were afraid of it. What frustrates me the most is you see a very wealthy person, might be worth $5 billion, $10 billion, gives away nothing during his or her lifetime, and at death, they, they leave it all to somebody else to figure it out. Jack Kent Cook, I'll mention his name, he, he, he was a you know, football owner, owned the Western Redskins, gave away virtually no money while he was alive. He dies, he doesn't leave his team to the son, he puts it all up 
to in a foundation. If the foundation is great, it gives away scholarship money. Maybe some of you have the scholarship, but it's about $2 billion fund or $2.5 billion. He gives away a lot of scholarships to good people. Why didn't he do it when he was alive? There's another well-known uh, man who died recently, John Kluge, who's a great philanthropist, but at one point when he was 94 years old, he gave Columbia University, his alma mater, I think $400 million for undergraduate gifts upon his death. What, what, you know, when he was 93 or 4, what, how much more did he need to wait for? I mean, to, I mean, did he need that extra $400 million for the last two years of his life? I don't know. Uh, so my frustration is a lot of people give away money way too late or they wait till they're dead and they, don't, they, should, they should actually get involved and try to um, manage it with the same care that they do with their investments. So uh, I wish people would just give away. And I, the other problem with the pledge that I'm trying to deal with is it's associated with billionaires giving away their money. And, and to the extent that philanthropy is seen as a billionaire boys club and people are giving away 50% of their money upon their death, I don't think it's going to be that useful. What we need to do is convince everybody that everybody is a philanthropist and can be a philanthropist with their money or their time, and everybody should be encouraging away something. It's not 50%, 10%, 5%, so that everybody in the country is doing something, not just the billionaires. And that's one of my frustrations with that pledge. So, question? Yes, sir. Um, well, you know, I was um, in this Jewish ghetto, but I wasn't that Jewish, really, in the sense that I went to synagogue a lot and so forth, and uh, I was operating the premise that, uh, you know, uh, maybe I could get to heaven by just, uh, you know, not doing something bad as opposed to doing something good. And uh, so I'm not that religious in that sense, but I do have a view that, um, you know, you don't have to be a particular religion or be religiously um, uh, observant in order to do things that are good or, or to worry about what other people are, are, are helping to make other people um, better than they are. What my view is, is that we're all on this earth for a very short period of time. It might seem long to you when you're studying one night or you've got a problem, but we're on, short, we're on earth for a very short period of time relative to the amount of time that the earth has been around. And during that period of time, you have a relatively small uh, period of time where you can really make a difference. And so what I think everybody wants to do on their deathbed or near their deathbed is say, I spent more time with my family. Everybody always says the same things. I, want to spend, I wish I had spent more time with my family, and I wish I had done some things to make the world a better place. And what I want to do is convince more people that they should think about how to make the world a little bit better place, or their own neighborhood a better place. And in my view, that's kind of a religion, which is to try to get other people to feel better about what their situation is, try to help other people to the extent you can. If you have money, give it away. If you have time, give it away. If you have ideas, give that away. And try, in the end, um, to use that as a religion. So I, I kind of, that's how, how I look at my religion, really. And, um, you know, I, I, I probably am not as uh, observant or involved in Jewish affairs as some people might uh, think that somebody in my background is. I, I just tend to be not as involved in, in the organized religion as, as other people. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, over the history of Carlisle, is there one deal that kind of sticks out to you? That yes. Like, the ones that went away, got away. Here are the ones that got away. Um, and I, one I sort of got away recently was my daughter went to Harvard. Um, she met a person she married recently. Um, his roommate at uh, Exeter was a guy named Mark Zuckerberg. And uh, so when he was at Harvard, when I, my daughter started going out with him, uh, he said, you know, I got this guy named Mark Zuckerberg. He's going to start this new company. He's going to drop out of college. Would you like to meet him? I think he's going to look for some money. I said, now what's the chance of another Harvard dropout really making a success himself? No, I don't want to. But I'll give you an example of another one that I, I screwed up on. Um, Carlisle bought a company called Baker & Taylor, the second largest book distributor in the United States, started in 1839, had not made a profit since 1839. Not, not a very profitable company. He bought it from W.R. Grace. And um, you know, book, prop, book distribution wasn't that big a business, and so it's a very mo modest margin. Um, so one day at a board meeting, a salesman said, well, I got a new idea how to make money. We published the only bibliography in the United States of all the books in print, other than the Library of Congress, and they don't sell theirs. So we can sell our bibliography to people who want to know about bibliographies. And I got an idiot that came in the other day and wanted to buy it for $100,000 a year for five years. $500,000. So we're going to get extra profits. Sounds like a good idea. So a couple months later, I'm reading about a guy in Seattle who's going to start a book company where he's going to sell books over the internet. I called the salesman and said, hey, there's another idiot out there who probably needs a bibliography. He says, no, that's the idiot that I already sold it to. So wait a second. You're only getting $100,000 a year from this guy. I think I heard his company's going to go public. I got to go out and see him. So I went out to see Jeff Bezos and I said, you know, I read this contract and uh, 
you know, I wish we'd gotten stock instead of cash. He said, I would have given you half the company at the time I had nothing. You had the only thing I needed. I don't want to give you half the company now, but I'll give you some stock. And he gave us uh, stock that became worth if we held on to it a couple billion dollars. We sold it right away at the IPO because we didn't think the company would get anywhere. But, um, <laughs> but I wish we had taken uh, half the company at the beginning. We should have thought about that. But uh, there are a lot of deals like that that got away. The best deal we ever did, and the deal that actually is the most successful deal in the history of private equity we did, um, it's a deal in China. We bought an insurance company in China called China Pacific Life. It was unprofitable at the time. We put in about $720 million and, uh, with partners, and we've made about a $6.5 billion profit. And that is a big profit for anybody. And on one deal, I don't think anybody else in private has done that. We're now in the process of liquefying it, but it's a great deal. That was our best deal. I wish I had more like that. Yes? What do you think is the key piece in the business school? The key what? The key thing missing from business school education today, I never went to business school, I don't know. Um, but um, I would say, um, you know, I, I do think that business ethics is something that should be taught. I don't know whether all the schools are doing it, I mean, maybe they do, but it is surprising to me that some schools, I don't think, have a strong enough emphasis on business ethics. I also think that um, one thing I would recommend that people do that isn't just business is this, and I alluded to it earlier. Um, there's a guy named Richard Neustadt, who was a famous professor at Harvard uh, Kennedy School. And he wrote a book called Presidential Power. It came out in 1960, or around then. And what he said is a president only has the power to persuade people. Only has the power to persuade. He can't force people to do anything. And I thought about that for a long time. And really, what business people have is only the power to persuade somebody. Because in business, all you can do is convince somebody to, to buy something from you. Or, or you're trying to convince somebody to, to, to buy something, a service or something, and you're always trying to convince somebody something else. In business, you can't do business by yourself. A writer can write something by himself. Einstein could sit by himself and come up with a theory. But in business, you're always selling somebody something or another, or trying to convince somebody something. And I think business schools don't, from my judgment, have a good enough emphasis on how you can um, improve one's communication skills. And there are two types of communication skills, writing and talking. And very often, students come to me who are you know, straight A's in their best business schools, but they can't talk, they can't communicate, and they can't write. And I think business schools will be better if they learn how to teach people how to communicate, because in the end, communication is everything. I also think people should learn in business schools a little bit more about um, philanthropy and what to do with money once they get it, as opposed to how to make it all. And then they, they're, not, they're not often taught in business schools how to be socially responsible with the money you get and how to be philanthropic. And I think those would be improvements. We've got time for two more questions. <clears throat> um, okay, yes, sir. Um, what are some of the principles and values that made um, Carlisle successful? Well, um, principles were these. One, always put the investors first. We always emphasize that it's the investors who made it possible. So we have to have a fiduciary mindset. We say the investors always come first. Second, we put our money where our mouth is. We put up $4 billion of our own money alongside the investors. So we try to convince the investors that we believe in everything we're doing. We're parallel to them. Third, we have a philosophy called one Carlisle. Everybody is part of the firm. If you want to worry only about your fund or your area, you're not going to be in the firm very long. If somebody from Australia calls somebody from uh, in Europe and says, help me on something, it doesn't help, they're not going to be in the firm very long. So everybody has to pull together and have a common culture. Great organizations like McKinsey or others, when you study them, what they have in common is a common culture. And what we're trying to do is have a common culture. And we think we've done that. And that's one of the important things as well. We also try to um, make sure that we spread the wealth within the firm. We don't want this the founders and the senior people to have all the wealth. So we spread the wealth to everybody in the firm. And, and, and that, we think that's an important principle that's helped us a lot. And also, um, taking, not taking undue risk. Uh, we, we try to be very mod modulate the, the kind of risk taking we take. In, in the public equity world, there's a thing called the sharp ratio, which more or less tells you whether you're your stock is very volatile and you've taken undue risk to get the return. An equivalent uh, statistic or measurement doesn't exist in private equity. So if I tell you my rates of return are 30% and somebody else is 30%, you don't know whether I've taken bigger risk to get that or not. But generally, we think we, we, we don't want to take big risk and we think we've convinced people that to get the rates of return we have, we're taking very, very modest risk. And last, ethics. We have a strong emphasis on ethics and making sure that people are highly ethical in the conduct that they, uh, that they engage in. Yes, ma'am. Um, how did you convince people to give you guys $5 million for your first fund when you guys I'm sorry, say that again? How did you convince people to give you $5 million for your first fund, even though you guys didn't have a track record? Not down on my knees. <laughs> it was vague a lot. Um, um, well, we didn't have a track record, but we had um, some people that knew us. So 
we, um, you know, we, we talked about our resumes and our backgrounds, and, and we had a lot of strings attached to it, and so we didn't have that much money. Uh, the trick was how do we go from $5 million to our first fund of $100 million, then a next fund of $1.2 billion. And what we did is we, you know, we would um, do one deal, and then the, the deal would lead to another deal, and, the, and as long as the record was pretty good, people would give you money. Money flows very quickly if you have a good track record, uh, so we were very cautious. And, and uh, originally, we just used some original contacts. Whenever you're raising money initially, you're probably going to raise it more likely for people you know than people you don't know. And it's very difficult today to get first funds off the ground. But we were lucky, and it took us a long time to, to raise that money. It wasn't uh, overnight. And our first deal, anybody wants to know what our first deal was, or not that successful, was called Chi Chi's. Anybody ever heard of this? It's a Mexican restaurant chain. So in those days, uh, we, we, we bought 4.9% of the company, and we went to see the CEO and said, we want to buy the company, the whole company. We thought he'd throw us out of his office because, you know, he never heard of us. And uh, we were, to our shock, he said, yes, I hate my board, I hate being a public company, let's go. Well, we only had enough money for the 4.9%, we didn't have the rest. So we, we had to go out to a guy who then, had, in those days, had minted money, a way to make money named Michael Milken. He had invented more or less the, using a junk bond for financing. And we went out to see him, and I'll never forget, and he's, I know him reasonably well now, he, we talked about this Mexican food company, he kept talking about the, the value and the joys of Mexico. We said, no, this is Mexican food, it's in the United States, not Mexico. But ultimately, he gave us the money. In those days, um, he, he had the ability to print money, more or less. He gave you a letter that said, highly confident. He was highly confident that he could raise the money, and that was like it's worth its weight in gold, and it was the equivalent of money. So that was our first deal, we made some money on it. But in the end, uh, one thing leads to another, and, and we had a reasonably good track record, and, and it kind of fed on raising more money. So let me thank you all for your attention, and I appreciate your taking time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what a wonderful experience for everyone that's been here tonight, and uh, we definitely did save the best for last. Thank you. We could not have, uh, can't thank you enough for coming here and sharing all your word, your vision and your, your words of inspiration and making everybody laugh a few times as well. Just thank, thank you. you so um, much. On behalf of the University of you. Maryland, President Lowe, Dean Anand, and Dean Courtney, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I, um, I tell you, I almost, almost didn't make it here today. I'm very happy I did, but I'll tell you how it came about and just uh, keep this in mind. I, I had some other things to do today, and, and uh, I, had to, I wanted to change and look a little fresh when I got here because I'd done a whole bunch of different things. So when I was coming here, I said to the driver, look, I need a motel so I can change and um, shave and, and, and go forth. So let's find a motel on the way here. I was coming from Washington, and, uh, and we were driving along, can't find any motels, nothing. Finally, we find an old beaten down motel, and I go there, and uh, I say, I need a room for 30 minutes. And, uh, <laughs> Oh, really? Yes. Uh, are you by yourself? No, I have this guy in the car with me. And uh, I said, uh, and she said, uh, do you have any credit cards? No, I don't have my credit cards with me. Uh, oh, really? And, and how am I going to know who you are? Well, I'll just pay you cash. Oh, really? Uh, let me talk to the manager. So the manager comes out and says, now, you want a room for 30 minutes. You know, what kind of place do you think we are? You know, I said, well, I don't know what kind of place you are, but I only need it for 30 minutes. I just want to take a shower and, and change. And he said, well, you can't just do this by the hour here, so you've got to pay the full rate. What is it? $40. I said, okay. <laughs> so I'm in there. I'm taking a shower, and I'm thinking, you know, if I have a heart attack now and die, the headline is going to be Carlisle co-founder wanted to rent a room for 30 minutes. <laughs> anyway, fortunately, that didn't happen. Thank you.